Hello, Bristol Better You community, community. My name is Sarah Bornstein, a freshman at Hofstra University, majoring in political science and public relations, and I will be hosting today's webinar. A little background on me, I grew up in Marblehead, a small coastal suburban town in Massachusetts. Our guest today is Larry Levy, the Executive Dean of Hofstra University's National Center for Suburban Studies, and a former senior editorial writer and chief political columnist for Newsday. We will discuss why suburban voters are a vital factor in the upcoming presidential election and what issues are important to them. He will also share observations from both Democratic and Na Republican national conventions where he served as a political commentator for both national and local news outlets. All right, for our first question, I was a student volunteer during this past presidential debate. Larry, I know you've been a po political columnist on Newsday for many years. Was this debate old hat for you, or did you discover something new? <laughs> well, was it old hat for you? Definitely not. <laughs> it must have been incredibly exciting. It was incredibly exciting. Well, you know, other people have asked me this question because this was my sixth debate. I was mm -hmm. a political columnist at Newsday, as you mentioned, uh, and it was uh, my 14th and 15th national conventions. But I have to tell you, I, I was as excited as a freshman. It was, um, and, and I guess if I stopped being excited, I'll, I'll get out of the business because if you don't, can't bring the excitement, whether you're a young dog or an old dog, um, you, you really shouldn't be doing whatever it is you're, you're being paid or asked to do. But I, I, I did find it very, very exciting um, in part because of the atmosphere. Uh, students were deeply engaged. I remember uh, from the 2008 debate, uh, which was Hofstra's first, uh, I was new on campus. and. I went to meetings of administrators and professors planning all kinds of programs, right? And my, I, I brought this stereotypical, cynical idea that students don't care about this stuff, and I was just blown away. Everybody on campus was involved in 08. Everybody was involved in 12. But for some reason, this year, the 2016 debate had more energy to it. And I think part of the reason was because we only found out two months before. <laughs> With the other debates, we had a year to plan. And you know, you, you, you get into a rhythm, it's, it's like a, a, a marathon, and finally you arrive at the finish line. This one was everybody working their, their, their tails off to get this thing done. Mm -hmm. The other reason I think that uh, this was maybe more exciting, and I'm struggling with the word to use, more <laughs> interesting, exciting, was because so much seemed to be at stake. Mm -hmm. You had a race between two un unusual candidates for their unpopularity, uh, for the differences between them in mm -hmm. terms of experience, uh, of course gender, the first time we had a woman, mm -hmm. but it was also a race that was tightening mm -hmm. based on national polls. And this debate was seen as absolutely pivotal, mm -hmm. a chance for one candidate or the other to break out, uh, and being this close to election mm -hmm. day, to break out in a permanent way. And I think it um, justified all the billing. It was the most watched debate mm -hmm. ever. Uh, it, and clearly, if we, if we want to pivot into the substance of it, um, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, I knew her as a senator. When I was at Newsday, <laughs> I covered her as a senator, so I, I keep calling her senator. But mm -hmm. Secretary Clinton, um, whether you like her or not, mm -hmm. whether you like the way she performed or not, mm -hmm. has surged back into a lead Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a national average lead of about five points. And this close to election day, mm -hmm. that's substantial. Um, there have been, excuse me, there have been instances in, um, in history mm -hmm. where a candidate has overcome that mm -hmm. deficit with this much time, but it's very unusual. Mm -hmm. So you put all that together, the little bit of time that we had, mm -hmm. and the incredible stakes, and the, the, the moment in the campaign, mm -hmm. and it was just something really special. And I know that many of my friends were there out there um, protesting. But Interesting, yeah. Yeah, many of their many of the political people who interviewed them uh -huh. were surprised that even Clinton and Trump supporters were standing next to each other talking. Do you right. think yeah, that the college students' willingness to converse helped create this euphoric atmosphere? I, well, I think that the 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 opportunity mm -hmm. that students were given. They were treated with respect. Mm -hmm. Their ideas were treated respectfully. Mm -hmm. They were given spaces and places mm -hmm. to have their say. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you, when you empower people like that, mm -hmm. when you show them respect, um, you, know, you, you encourage a, a degree of civility. 
I also think Hofstra, you know, I, I've been here nine years, so, so I, I don't consider myself a kind of a lifer, like totally institutionalized. And I feel like I could say objectively, it's a very special place, Hofstra. Uh, you should feel comfortable sending your children and grandchildren to Hofstra <laughs> University. That's my, um, my pitch. Um, um, it, it, because we encourage mm -hmm. civility on campus. Mm -hmm. We, we um, uh, you, you, you don't see some of the noisiest and angriest protests mm -hmm. on this campus that you see on others. Um, you don't see some of the more polarizing mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. on this campus that you see on other campuses. So I, th I think that all that combined to make this very, very special for students mm -hmm. and for, you know, uh, administrators and, f and journalists, mm -hmm. it was just very special. And I know that a lot of Gary Johnson supporters came out during the debate. What do you think third party candidates will have an effect? Do you think any third party candidates will affect this election at all? If, if the race tightens again, mm -hmm. um, the third party candidates could I indeed have a, uh, a decisive impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I, when I was at Newsday, I was covering the 2000 presidential campaign. And I spent uh, six weeks in Florida after it was supposed to be over watching the election officials and, and uh, judges and, and others count hanging chads. Do any of you remember hanging chads? You know, you haven't <laughs> lived until you've hung on a hanging chad. Um, and then the Supreme Court, while I was up in Tallahassee, made its ruling, and uh, that was the end of that. But uh, Ralph Nader, who was running, I think, as a Green Party candidate, he was definitely as a minor party candidate, well-known guy, didn't get a lot of votes nation. I mean, didn't get a high percentage nationwide, maybe mm -hmm. a point or two. I, I, I don't have it at my fingertips. But in Florida, where you know the the difference was, mm -hmm. you know, point oh 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 something. Mm -hmm. um, the votes that he got may have mm -hmm. pitched the election to George Bush. So, so if we get to a close election where um, you know, we're up really late at night and counting votes in Wisconsin and Michigan and, and uh, uh, you know, Maine's second congressional district up there in the <laughs> North Country where there are more cows than voters. Um, uh, I love Maine. Uh, if anybody's from Maine, I didn't mean to insult you. Um, but, uh, you, you know, uh, yeah, the, the votes that a Gary Johnson or a Jill Stein get could make a difference in a decisive state. Remember, we, we don't have a national election mm -hmm. per se. We have 50 separate state elections that add up to a national election. And all it takes is one state flipping unexpectedly in the wrong direction or being unexpectedly close to keep us up late at night and sometimes in court for weeks and weeks. So going off of that, how sure. important are swing states in this election? And do you believe that suburban voters can sway it? Well, my, my th and thank you for asking about the suburban voters because, you know, my, I make my living uh, and have made my living focusing on suburban voters. I was the chief political columnist at Newsday at the time I came to Hofstra. I was the senior editorial writer. I worked on, uh, I held just about every job you could hold at Newsday without being a big boss, right? <laughs> I was a big Indian, but not a chief. And, uh, uh, and I focused on suburban communities and suburban voters. And I've taken that to Hofstra. We have something called the National Suburban Poll. We do analysis of, of uh, suburban voting patterns. We look at um, healthcare, transportation, poverty, everything uh, that you could ever imagine from the suburban perspective. And what I've learned over the years is that the suburban voters since the 1988 election, this is going back a long way, have been the decisive voting bloc in this country. They are what we call swing voters. Now think about it for a second. All of us, however hundreds of people are out there and Sarah and I, we could sit over a beer or a glass of milk or whatever it is and, and come to uh, be pretty certain in predicting how the cities of this country are going to go. You all know what, what that's going to be. It, they're going to vote Democratic. We also could then take a look at all the um, voters out in the country, uh, out in the mountain states, down south, away from the urban centers. Well, they're going to vote Republican. They're red. So you have the blues focused in cities and metro areas. You have the reds focused in rural um, uh, areas. 
it's the people in the suburbs that tend to go back and forth and back and forth. Now, Long Island is what we call a quintessential, a prototypical suburban swing area. The problem, if you haven't already guessed this, is that we are in a blue state. So even though we look just like the voters who are in these swing areas, and I'll, I'll get to where those areas are and, and what that really means in, on the ground, but even though um, uh, you know, we are just like those swing voters, um, the votes that we cast here are not going to change the outcome of the presidential race. Doesn't mean you shouldn't vote. It's very important to get out and vote for a variety of reasons, uh, which I won't even go into. I think you should know that by now. And in fact, uh, you know, people uh, like, like me and like you who are over the age of 65, um, uh, you know, are probably the most reliable um, voters there are. We come out in the highest numbers of any other. So I don't have to give you a lecture on your civic responsibilities. But if you live in a, a blue state or a red state, your vote is going to be diluted. So what are the swing states? Now, now that sort of depends on who you are and, and who you're rooting for. But by and large, there are usually in every election 10 or 12 swing states. There are 20 or so uh, or, or more uh, uh, that go Republican. There are 15, 17 that go Democratic. Uh, uh, there are more people in the Democratic states. There are about 10 or 12 states that go back and forth or that are within three or four points in every year. Uh, what are they? Well, this year the swing states are, and I'll try to see if I can remember this, I don't want an oops moment but from that, remember the governor of Texas who said, I have three things I'm going to change. And he got to three and he went, ooh, what was that third one? So you'll have to forgive me, but it's New Hampshire, it's uh, Pennsylvania, it's Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, um, uh, Ohio, uh, Colorado, uh, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, and there may be one or two others in there that we could argue about. Um, and how those states go is going to determine the election. But within each state, with I don't think any exceptions this year, when, when New Mexico is in play, it would be an exception. But um, it, with, with I don't think a single exception, it's the suburbs of these states that will decide which candidate wins those states. Even New Hampshire. New Hampshire you think of as this rural, rural state. Again, as I, as I said irreverently, more, more cows than voters. Um, but uh, New Hampshire, if you really look at the demographics of it and the, and the geo political skew of where people live and how they vote, um, most people live in urban centers. Manchester is one of them. Um, and the suburbs of Manchester look a lot like the suburbs of New York City and uh, Philadelphia, places like that. Um, also, the more ruralish areas that you'd think would be farm and, and uh, tourist country in southern New Hampshire is really a suburb of Massachusetts. So these are suburban voters. Most of the, half the people there, they commute to Boston. Long ride, but they do it. In fact, my, my nephew does it. Um, so I know. I know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so these suburban communities, as I said, go back and forth. And um, the four counties outside of Philadelphia, they are going to determine which candidate takes um, Pennsylvania. Uh, the four suburban counties outside of Washington, D.C., uh, Fairfax, Loudoun, Prince William, and Alexandria, are going to determine who wins that state. And I can go all around the country, the I-4 corridor. If you all know uh, Florida, um, southern Florida is like New York and New Jersey, literally and figuratively. Half the people live there are from those two states. And they vote like northern Democratic uh, 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 voters do. Northern Florida is like Alabama and Mississippi. It, it's very, very Republican. But there's a corridor, the Interstate 4, I-4, that goes, uh, cuts across the middle of the state. Um, uh, it includes Orlando. And Orange County is a swing area, includes Hillsborough County for Tampa, parts of Sarasota County, 
And again, how those areas go is going to determine who wins Florida. So, so the suburbs are incredibly important. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, Somebody may want to ask me why. I'll, I will take questions later. It's very complicated, and it's also debatable, too. I have my opinion on it. There are other scholars and, and, and operatives and activists uh, in, in the political sphere who have different opinions. So I want you to know this is not <laughs> gospel fixed in stone. All right, and you mentioned early on that you said that New York is mostly a blue state. Do you think this election could change that in any way? No. No? No. I know that, um, and, and not to be disrespectful of any of the candidates, mm -hmm. I know that Donald Trump's people have mm -hmm. been saying, some are still saying that they think they have a shot to win New York. No, um, no Republican has won New York since, I believe, Ronald Reagan. I don't mm -hmm. think George... Bush won in 88. I'm almost certain he didn't. And somebody can, you all can call me up and tell me that I ought to lose my uh, academic standing here. But it's been a very long time, right? There also are no statewide Republican officials. Um, uh, vast majority of the congressional seats in New York are held by uh, Democrats. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the, I believe there's a four to one enrollment edge where Democrats have four times as many people enrolled as Republicans. So all those facts, mm -hmm. uh, plus Hillary Clinton had an experience in New York mm -hmm. that arguably could, would cancel out Donald Trump's claim to be a New Yorker as well. Uh, I would say that um, uh, the answer is absolutely not. This is something, a state that Clinton and the Democrats um, are not thinking twice about. Um, and if the Republicans are actually spending money in the state, and there's no indication that they are, um, then they're making a big mistake because they have to win. For Trump's only chance of winning at this point mm -hmm. with the polls as they are mm -hmm. is that he has a great performance mm -hmm. in the next debate, really turns it around as people mm -hmm. saying, huh, I could see this guy as president, uh, you know, as they did, in fact, in, in, in 2012. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, as they did in, in 1980 when Ronald Reagan had a weak first debate mm -hmm. and people were saying, you know, the Gipper is really not up to a, the national stage. He was a governor, he was an actor, mm -hmm. uh, but in the second debate he turned it around and people said, I can imagine him as president. They had their doubts about Jimmy Carter and he went on to win an enormous landslide. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that can happen in this case. The the the, the there, there are funda what we call fundamentals mm -hmm. that just aren't the same. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the country is more democratic than it was back then. Mm -hmm. uh, New York was a swing state in 1980, mm -hmm. very much so. Uh, Reagan won it in 80, and he won it in 84, I believe. So, um, uh, you know, it's a, just a different world. Mm -hmm. So, no, New York, New York is safe. Just like, um, you know, there are, there are polls that show um, Georgia closing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's bad sign for Trump because mm -hmm. that should be as safe a mm -hmm. Republican seat mm -hmm. as New York is for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, Clinton is not likely to win Georgia, mm -hmm. in part because she's not going to spend the money there. Mm -hmm. Because she knows that if she wins Florida mm -hmm. and she wins uh, along with all the seats that Democrats usually win, mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's going to win. Mm -hmm. So. Why waste time in Georgia? Mm -hmm. let, let Trump worry about Georgia while she's piling on in Florida. So that's how they play. It's a chessboard. Mm -hmm. It's a chessboard. They do not run 50 um, equal campaigns. They pick out the 10 or 12 states that they have to win. And as the game unfolds, they may see polls uh, looking better for them and pull their money for a month or two until things get a little tighter. And then maybe they'll go back in. Uh, but the key is to have what we call the infrastructure, have the organization in place, have the money set aside, have the advertising time reserved so that you can do that. And that's one of the th areas where Clinton has a m big advantage over Trump. Not just having more money, which is unusual that a Democrat has more money than a Republican, but also having m a, a, what we call a better ground game, more uh, field offices, more paid staff uh, in, in individual states, uh, more advertising buys. So, uh, you know, right now things look good for Clinton, but Trump is close enough so that he can still win. And now, lots of political col columnists have been talking about Trump's strategy. It's different from them in the past. Yes. He doesn't do a, as much groundwork as some of the past candidates, instead of using these large performance right. type events. Do 
do you think that it's that what he's doing now is going to be revolutionary for debates in the future, or is it hurting him in the long run? Yeah, um, it's a great question, um, and I'm always leery of crystal ball type <laughs> answers because, especially when they're being taped, and somebody could play it back and said, "Larry, look at what you said. I can't believe how wrong you were." And I have to tell you, and I'm saying this honestly, and if this discredits me as as an expert worthy of your time, you know, so be it. But people who have been covering politics for a long time, who tend to be conventional thinkers, and I don't say that in a negative sense, we've been around a long time, we've seen a lot of things, we, we, we know what, what's worked in terms of analysis, and we know what tends not to work. This year has been such an outlier, such an anomaly, particularly with Donald Trump, that many of us have been wrong at major points in the campaign. Um, um, I'll give you an example in my case. In the end, I never believed that Trump would win the, um, uh, even though I predicted what he would get overall in the primaries, uh, up until the point where it stopped being competitive, I, I didn't feel that those numbers were enough to win a primary. He was getting 32, 33%. But he got a little lucky, and he, got, and he was good. He had 16 people, so that 30% in most cases was good enough to win states. Um, he also um, was willing to say and do things that other candidates would never have said before. And uh, because of his public persona and what people expected uh, from him as the reality TV guy who coined, you're fired, um, they just sort of tolerated and, 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 and accepted it. And the people he was running against had no idea how to deal with this. Marco Rubio at first wilted, then he tried to come on you know, boisterously, and it just didn't work because it didn't suit his character where it worked for Donald Trump. So, so yeah, did, did, did I predict the numbers that Trump would get? Uh-huh. Did I realize that 16, out of 16 candidates, the Republicans couldn't come up with one, couldn't coalesce around one like they used to do in the old days? when I was a young reporter, um, uh, uh, no, they didn't. So, so in, I turned out to be right but wrong. And a lot of journalists, if they're honest, will tell you that. So when I say that, um, uh, when, when you ask me about whether what he's doing has, will work, well, it worked for the primary. Um, it seems to, seem to have been working at times during the general election when things tightened up a bit, but in the end, You've got to have a ground game. You've got to have money. You've got to be able to speak, and not to come back to my, to my, you know, where I make my living in the suburbs, but you've got to find a way to pivot from your base. You know, if you're a Republican, it's your conservative base. If you're a Democrat, it's your progressive liberal base, to speak to moderate suburban voters. And this is the area where, however he does it, with big rallies, with tweets, He's not reaching them. And I'll give you some examples. Virginia primary, really Marco Rubio's last stand. Trump beat him 35 to 32 in Virginia. Important state, swing state. In the four suburban counties that I mentioned, the decisive four, Rubio beat him 40 to 28. And I looked at that and I said, Trump's got a lot of work to do with suburban voters. And in almost every state, including most that Trump won, his numbers were lower in these suburban communities. So even Republicans, suburban voters, had their doubts. And what we're seeing um, right now in a poll that I saw in Virginia, uh, which is almost considered a safe state now for Clinton, um, Trump was down 40 points. That's four zero points in those four suburban communities uh, outside of Washington, D.C. And we're seeing not quite numbers that stark, but similar numbers all over the country. And unless Trump can find a way through the debate or some other mechanism, some other message, some other means, um, um, he's gonna be in a lot of trouble. Um, it, it, so, so the obvious question, and I, I know you've got it written down there, so I'm, I'm jumping you there, um, is, well, why is Trump having trouble with suburban voters, particularly women? Well, some of it may be obvious to you, um, and if you're not a Trump fan, you're going, yeah, duh. But, um, you know, just to try to be as nonpartisan as possible, and the National Center for Suburban Studies prides itself 
and not taking advocacy positions. Um, one is that suburban voters, for suburban voters, it's a package of style and substance. On the style side of things, they tend to, and these are the moderates in, in, in the suburbs. I mean, there are liberals in the suburbs, there are conservatives in the suburbs, but there's also a preponderance of these moderate swing voters, more than you tend to find in cities and more than you tend to find in rural areas, where people either tend to be very liberal or very conservative. They tend to be leery of people who seem and even sound extreme. Mm -hmm. When the Democrats were um, seen as unpatriotic and, and condescending mm -hmm. uh, on the Vietnam War and on issues like abortion, mm -hmm. uh, suburban uh, Catholics, for example, abandoned the Democratic Party and became what we called Reagan Democrats mm -hmm. in 80, 84. And even, even in 88, they were still around for uh, Reagan's vice presidential candidate, uh, the first uh, George Bush. Um, eventually, those voters came back. These were white working class voters. And ironically, that is Donald Trump's base. Mm -hmm. Trump has managed to solidify. There's nothing he's or done that has cost him votes mm -hmm. among lesser educated mm -hmm. white working class voters. That's his base. That's his 38, 39 percent. It's what got him through the primary, and, it what, and it's what's keeping him close enough to win in the general election. Mm -hmm. On issues of substance, um, suburbanites, um, you know, they don't like taxes, <laughs> but if you watch the school district elections, they willingly tax themselves to death. They're willing to vote for school budgets, for example, if they feel the school district sharing their values on education and uh, are delivering value. If they think that what they're paying is worth it, they go to the polls and approve it. And we had 99 point something percent of school budgets, for example, on Long Island approved for some of the highest taxes in the land. So they're not anti-tax, right? They're not anti-government because they're homeowners, they're business owners, and they realize that even though they don't want government you know, deeply embedded in their lives, they realize that they need government as a partner. They need good cops, they need good streets, they need parks to make, make uh, uh, th their communities appealing so that they, if they have a business, they can attract workers. They certainly need great schools to, to, to keep the workforce up uh, and to attract um, uh, uh, people, people here. I mean, if, if you don't have great schools in a high cost area, why would a business move here? If you don't have a great workforce, there's no reason for them to be here other than, if they have a connect, other than having a connection to New York City. So, so when these voters hear national Republicans uh, trashing government, talking about eliminating the Department of Education, privatizing Social Security, all these safety net programs, and I'm not arguing whether they, they're right or wrong, I'm just saying that when these moderates hear this, it makes them nervous. It, it makes them feel that their investment that their partner, an arm, they want an arm's length partner, they don't want to co cozy up to them, but their partner in government could be threatened. Um, there are other, it, when you get specifically to moderate, well-educated suburban women, I mean, even people of, 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 with, of, of, you know, of, of faith, um, when we poll the issue like abortion, for example, um, you know, it's 75% or thereabouts support a woman's right to choose, right? Um, uh, the National Republican Party has made a main platform uh, eliminating Roe Wade. Mm -hmm. And even if you, and, and, and a lot of those 75% of people who personally are opposed to abortion, they just realize that you know, people should make up their own mind on this. And that, um, so, so the National Republican Party has hurt Republicans mm -hmm. in these moderate suburban areas by what are perceived, right or wrong, fair or not, what are perceived as extreme positions. So the style and tone of Trump mm -hmm. and um, the fact that he is part of the Republican Party um, and that he is a bit of a wild card on policy, they don't know what direction he's going to go, um, and his core supporters mm -hmm. make them very nervous. And it's showing up in the polls. All right, and you talked a little bit about patriotism in your little cell anyways. Great. Sure. <laughs> I know that the RNC and the DNC both focus on different things in their conventions, and there's been news floating around about how the RNC was much more negative, yes. and actually the DNC, which is always usually right. thought of as late, less patriotic, 
was actually more patriotic. Right. Uh, it's yeah. a great, great observation, Sarah. Um, I was in um, both uh, uh, Cleveland and Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and those are, as I said before, my 14th and 15th national conventions. My first one was um, as a student, actually. Uh, I was a student journal, a student intern. Well, I just graduated, but I continued an internship at uh, a, a newspaper in central Massachusetts. And um, they, uh, uh, they asked me, um, they, one of the guys knew that I had a, uh, my mother lived in Florida, and, uh, and I had cousins in Florida. I went down a lot. They say, any chance you're going to be going down there around the time of the, of the, the Miami Convention in 72? And I, I realized that there was a way of seeing if they can get me down there without having to pay, without having to pay my expenses, <laughs> of course. And I said, absolutely. And I went there, and I, I basically fed notes on what st the student demonstrator was doing. And I wrote one, one column, my, one piece myself. Um, but uh, uh, I attended every one since 1992 uh, for, for Newsday. And then um, uh, in, in 2008, I, I worked for um, the New York Times has a feature called the Campaign Stops blog. And for uh, October, and I, I worked for them during that. And I worked for the Hearst Syndicate, News Syndicate, uh, the, in, the, in 2012 and 20, in this year. Uh, plus doing talking head stuff, as I normally do, for the different television stations. News 12. CBS. Um, I'm being silly, forgive me. Um, so anyways, um, the, these, these conventions, um, it, it was, the, these were alternate realities and they were almost f flipped, as Sarah indicated. Um, usually Republicans have this upbeat, optimistic, you know, win one for the Gipper. Ronald Reagan patented this, talking about mourning in America. And um, it's been effective. It's, it, it's been seen as the party of hope, the party of the future. That's the way the Republicans have managed to shape things, and very patriotic. The Republican convention was relentlessly negative, as Sarah said. Wh whether you feel that was justified or not, whether you think America is in a negative place, but we're just not used to hearing that from Republicans. Plus, Trump, as we've seen throughout the campaign, had a horrible time staying on message. I remember the first day of the Republican convention in Cleveland was billed as um, make America stronger uh, and, and unity. And that morning, before the, just as the, the convention is getting going, the national, Trump's national chairman starts trashing the Republican governor of Ohio, who's the host governor, who's the most, who, who uh, was one of Trump's competitors in the primaries who's the most popular Republican, most popular politician of all in Ohio, a state that Trump absolutely had to win, and this dominated the news cycle. And every day, whether it was his wife and the alleged plagiarism, um, uh, any, any number of different things, it really kept them off message. But they still gained a little ground. They got a little bounce out of that. Um, Clinton uh, convention, on the other hand, every day, they were on message. They got off to a rocky start on that s Sunday with all the Bernie Sanders people booing all over the place and Sanders being booed himself as a turncoat, as a Benedict, Benedict Sanders, you know, as a Benedict Arnold. Um, uh, and, and eventually they pulled themselves together. Um, they were very memorable speeches and Clinton got a very big bounce. But, but, you know, and this is the lesson. I don't know how much time we have left, but, you know, I started out by saying or early on that Clinton's got a pretty solid five-point lead. Um, uh, she's winning in every state she absolutely has to win. She's ahead in most of the swing states except for, I guess, uh, Ohio. Um, but she's been up five points before. Um, Trump has managed to close the gap before. The only difference is that the things that have caused Trump problems are starting to become more crystallized. You know, it's very hard to change people's perceptions and opinions, and we're running out of, and he's running out of time. There's what, how many days left now? Today's what, October what? Fourth. October 4th, a month to go to election day. Fifth. Fourth, fourth, fifth. <laughs> What's a day among friends, right? right. Yeah, so all I'm right. sorry. No, yeah. it's all right. And you mentioned you've been at every RNC since 1992. How has the media coverage of politics changed since back then? Well, I have to tell you, um, you know, uh, the biggest change, there are two big changes in, in journalism, two big changes. 
One is, is human and one is technical. And I, I know your, 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 your question sort of oriented more to the technical. The human changes are that, and it's the same in politics, by the way. I know I'm getting older, right? Uh, uh, you know, th th no question about that. I can mark it on a calendar. Um, but the reporters at even the major news outlets are getting younger. I mean, I'm seeing people 23, 24, 25 years old reporting for major news operations now. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, that, that has upsides and downsides to it. The upside is you get um, very smart young people who are committed to real journalism, not the phony stuff you see on some of, some of the websites that are really just advertising or partisan um, uh, uh, platforms for for one group or another, but I'm talking about ser serious uh, online or print um, or a combination of the two organizations. And um, the downside is, you know, again, I don't want to sound like an old curmudgeon, but the downside is that, you know, the wisdom comes with some experience and, and um, you know, when, when somebody is 25 years old and they're covering a national campaign, I want to know how many school board meetings they went to. I want to know how many uh, the you know uh, uh, police precincts they were. I want to know how many times they had to interview somebody who had just lost a loved one um, as a result of a policy that they're now covering, or maybe they studied at Harvard or Hofstra um, uh, theoretically and in a classroom and, and are, are, are brilliant young minds. But but I'm concerned about the lack of experience. When, when I was covering, um, uh, I, uh, like I said, I. I I, I covered a lot of presidential campaigns, um, and sometimes I would go out on the, on the bus like a reporter. I covered them mostly as a columnist at Newsday. By the time I was covering presidential campaigns, I was already working for the viewpoint section. I was a columnist. I wrote opinion. I wasn't writing news. And I, you know, I'd be on, the, I, but I would go on the bus because I think you, good opinion has got to be informed by, by by solid facts and reporting and getting out and talking to real people. And I'd be on the campaign buses and the airplanes. And we, you know, we, at the end of the day, uh, and here's the transition to the big difference, because there, there is no end of the day anymore. There used to be an end of the day. You'd file your stories by 6 o'clock, and the next time people would see it or hear it would be when they got the paper in the morning. Or maybe on the 11 o'clock news, they'd get it for 30 seconds. Nowadays, and I'm getting a little ahead of what I wanted to say, it never stops. It literally is 24-7. But anyways, I would talk to these folks, and they, they, they were really smart people. Um, and some of them actually had been around six or seven years in Washington. They started out maybe as an intern at the Washington Post or at the New York Times in the Washington bureaus. They maybe had been a, uh, a worked at the Brookings Institution. They may have uh, worked as, a, as a, a, an aide on, on, uh, you know, on Capitol Hill. They really knew Washington. But I would, you know, I would, it, it, we'd be talking about the latest proposal from this candidate or that candidate to change this big national program. And I realized that most of them had absolutely no idea how they played out in the real world. They'd never, as I said before, sat at a board of supervisors meeting till two in the morning where they're fighting over the budget and, 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 and wondering about where that money is going to come from, from Washington and Albany. Um, and, and I was lucky. I didn't think I was lucky at the time, but I was lucky that before I got the, the right, the privilege to express my opinion, um, the, the right to report on national events, I had an idea of what the neighborhoods were like, what our readers were like, and I don't think that a lot of the people now have that. And, you know, again, they do great work, but I think there's something missing in the wisdom end. So how did it change? Technology. My God. Um, uh, the reporters are, are where, where I would write one story of a thousand words, let's say, uh, based on reporting all during the day. Now they're writing 10 and 12 mini stories, and then sometimes a longer story at the end of the day. There are print deadlines, but with, with social media, with websites, there are no there's no printing press that has to run. It's instantaneous. Um, again, upsides and downsides. The upside is that the information gets out to people really quickly. Um, they don't have to wait. Um, it, in some cases, it's unfiltered. Um, and this is not just what they get from news people, but they get it from the campaigns. If you don't want to 
don't care what reporters are, are, are say. If you don't care about their experience and the filters that they provide, uh, if you're concerned about biases, well, then you can just hear what you want to hear from individual campaigns. If you only want good news and good things about Hillary Clinton, you can go to the Clinton campaign website. You don't need to deal with a reporter. I think you'd be making a big mistake if you did that with either Clinton or Trump. Um, uh, you know, it's really a mix. Uh, I read the Wall Street Journal, I read the New York Times. These are two different newspapers in terms of opinion, but professional reporters in terms of uh, uh, you know, how they go about gathering facts. So um, I, 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 the downside is that uh, you know, we would get a tip, let's say, in the morning, or, or something would happen, or we've heard something that seemed pretty clear to us at 10, 11 in the morning, and you tell your boss, well, I'm working on this story. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Keep, keep me in the loop. Call me in a couple hours. Well, a couple hours later, it, it may have just evaporated into thin air, and by 5 o'clock that day, you don't even, you, you, you've completely forgotten about it because it didn't exist. It wasn't a real story. But at 10 o'clock nowadays, you're going to put something up on the web. And, and, it, it, and then you could say, well, okay, you know, you, you follow it up, and if it doesn't have legs and it doesn't, isn't true, it'll evaporate. But no, it's on the web, it, it lives forever. And also, it, it gets reporters going off in certain directions, and then they become invested in it because they don't want to seem like they were wrong. And you go down what we call, you know, from Alice in Wonderland, you go down rabbit holes. So you miss other stories, and you spend too much time chasing those rabbits. Those, you know, those, those down the rabbit holes. So, um, you know, again, up, upsides and downsides to all of this. I'm, I'm glad I, 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 I don't have to tweet out eight, <laughs> ten stories a day. There are people who want me to do this. So far, I've resisted. All right, for our last question. Yes. Um, what are the primary concerns of suburban voters in this election? Oh, well, that's a big question. Um, suburban voters care about the same things that everybody cares about. It's, it, you know, they care about the economy, they care about terrorism, they care about um, uh, the, uh, employment. But suburban voters tend to be, on average, better educated than, than the average voter in the city, even if city voters are supposed to be more sophisticated. The average voter is better educated. The average voter is more likely to own their own business. The average voter is uh, a, a little older, out in the suburbs now, a flip from when my parents moved out here in 55, where everybody was young. Yeah, but this is not my, my mother and father's suburb anymore. So, um, um, but it's the, again, it's, it links up to an answer I gave earlier on about style and substance. Um, they, they listen in a different way. They want steadiness. They tend to want experience. Um, they like optimism because what is the suburbs except an expression of optimism? You move, you invest everything you have in a home, uh, you, you put your kids in a school where you, you hope it'll help them, you know, uh, exceed what you've achieved and have a happy, successful, prosperous life. Um, but um, they're, they're very concerned about um, education, and they're not hearing much on that. They're very concerned, particularly people in the baby boom generation, which is the largest voting bloc in the suburbs. They're concerned, they're, they're, they're part of what we call a sandwich generation, concerned about their aging parents, um, concerned about their aging selves as they, uh, you know, approach retirement, and they're concerned about their children. Will they amass so much college debt they won't be able to, 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 to do, to have any choices? Uh, and, and they're starting to worry about their grandchildren. I, I don't have any grandchildren yet, but, but, you know, these are something that the sandwich baby boom generation is thinking about. And again, that means if you, if you're contemplating your, 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 your parent or your grandparent's future, let's say, in a, in a beautiful facility like the, like the Bristol or in other places. My mother lived in a, in, a, in a lovely place like the Bristol out in Sonoma, California for many, many years. She loved it, it was a beautiful place. Um, you know, you worry, how much is this gonna cost? And what about the people who don't have the wherewithal to afford beautiful places? Where's the safety net gonna be? Um, who's gonna help defer the cost of college education? You need government, again, even if you don't want them like looking over your shoulder all the time and in your backyard and in your, in your bedroom and in your boardroom, um, you, you, you do need them as a partner. You need to be assured that there won't be huge changes in Social Security and huge changes in um, uh, Medicare and, uh, and, and you gravitate towards people talking about making college more affordable. In the last 12 years, again, whether they were right or wrong, whether their policies were correct or not, 
the Democrats have struck these moderate voters as being a little more reasonable and a little more focused on their concerns. It can turn around. It can turn around on a dime. But um, uh, it, 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 it is, in the long term, most of these aging suburbs are going to be reliable democratic places, in part because of demographic changes. That there are more and more new immigrants and other minorities who tend to vote democratic, and because of the, the um, Republican Party's uh, positions on immigration uh, and on other race-related issues, they're probably going to be reliable democratic voters for at least a generation. So the suburbs are a swing area now. Many of them are starting to trend Democrat, but they will vote for the quote unquote right Republican in a, in a nanosecond. All right, and we are out of time. So wow, that went fast. Going by fast. So we're going to open up to questions from the community. Let's hear a hand for Sarah. I know we can't hear your hand, but let's hear one. She did an incredible job, a freshman at Hofstra University with that kind of poise and <laughs> intelligence. I felt bad. You were talking about years that I wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have perspective to view it as history. Uh, what role has fact-checking played in, in this election, and do you think it has an impact? Th that's a good question. Um, and in fact, it's related um, to the one you asked about uh, what's, what's different. Um, technology has, I mean, uh, let me back up a second. Journalists have always fact-checked, but I would check a fact and then you wouldn't read about it for, it would become part of my story. I would say that you know, it would be part of writing the story that I file at six or seven o'clock in, in, in the evening that you don't read until the next morning. What technology allows uh, news organizations or for that matter the political campaigns themselves to do is to so-called fact check, to take a statement that uh, one of the candidates says and subject it to whether it's true or not. Um, social media uh, and the web are, are great opportunities for doing this in real time uh, or in almost real time. And um, um, more and more news organizations are um, uh, taking advantage of it. But I have to tell you, um, I, I, you know, I, I try to talk to people on both sides of the aisle and different ideologies. And um, when I get into a discussion with one of them and I say, you know, um, I understand what you're saying, but that's not the fact. Let me tell you what the facts are. And they'll listen to it and they say, where did you get that from? I say, well, um, Polyfact, which won a Pulitzer Prize for fact checking, um, I said they're probably the most reliable. It's the mainstream or lamestream media. So in other words, what's happened is social media has contributed so much to the polarization and incivility that people are not even accepting facts. Now, of course, a fact sometimes is the average of two opinions and probably shouldn't have that word to it. And sometimes the fact checkers want to introduce their own personality and snarkiness. Like for example, there was a statement that Governor uh, Pence made um, that was uh, fact checked uh, by the New York Times, which again, Republicans and conservatives would say, oh, they're a liberal newspaper. You know, I mean, okay, if they want to say that, uh, but these are reporters who are, are trained to recognize what's, what's a fact and what's not a fact. Um, you know, they're not on the editorial page, which expresses the opinion. But in it, it said, and, and the, the headline of the fact check, like, made my head spin. I go, what? They found that what he said was true? The, it was just the journalist being kind of snarky. It was being, being sarcastic. And, and they were actually saying, no, P Pence was wrong, and here's the quote from, you know, a certain day. So, you know, the fact checkers have to be careful that they don't use this as a way to, to bring attention to themselves, you know, and, and uh, diluting uh, the impact uh, and the credibility of what they do. But fact checking is a big deal. It's everybody has to do it now. Uh, it's a good thing they're doing it. But eventually we're going to come down to, just like we now have the poll of polls, because any one poll can be all over the place, but there are poll aggregators like this the website 538.com, New York Times has one. Um, there are several other services that basically take hundreds of polls 
and do an average of them. Those tend to be much more accurate for the big picture. We're going to now have um, um, a, a fact checking of fact checking, where you'll have an aggregation of where, like, 20 fact checkers found, of the 20 fact checkers, 17 found it to be true and three found it to be wrong. So there's an 85% probability. I, it's, it makes me crazy, you know? But the one thing about the internet is that, that it gives anybody who cares and is willing to put in the time the opportunity to get more information about anything than one ever could have in the past. So there's the, the, the potential for um, finding the truth with a small T or a capital T to gain wisdom, we just haven't quite gotten our arms around how to do that. But we have to because it's our present and will be even more so our future. All right, Eastman has a question. Do you think Bernie supporters will vote for Hillary? Well, that's a, again a great question. Uh, one of the big structural questions, um, uh, structural issues of the campaign. Most polls show that a good 90% of Sanders supporters are um, supporting Clinton. Um, Trump's having a little more of a problem getting all the supporters of his opponents, uh, but he has most of them as well. Um, there still is a sliver, and this gets back to the question about the third party candidates. There still is a, maybe more than a sliver, a little chunk of Sanders supporters who will never vote for Hillary. So either they're going to stay home or they're going to vote for a third party candidate or um, in some very un rare ex exceptions they're going to vote for Trump. Um, and, and, I, and I have spoken to, to Sanders supporters who are voting for Trump. So um, again, if it turns out to be a close race, uh, those Sanders supporters could make a difference. And if they are Democratic voters normally, then they will make a difference in terms of hurting Clinton. Um, by the same token, the uh, Republicans who are not supporting Trump, uh, if they stay home or vote for the minor party uh, or, or Clinton, they're, they're hurting Trump. So uh, you know, it's still one of the few wild cards, question marks that's out there. All right, another question from East Meadowbrook. Pence was promoting himself and not Trump. Why do you think so? Well, I mean, that, that, that's, an, that's an opinion, and it's, and it's not an unreasonable opinion that he was promoting himself and not Trump. Um, Pence had a very difficult position. Pence um, had to um, stop the bleeding that started uh, even just before the, the, the first presidential debate, uh, particularly with these suburban swing voters uh, we've been talking about. Um, so he had to present a moderate, reasonable, at least style and tone. By the same token, uh, his job in this uh, ticket was to bring over conservative voters who um, are distrustful of Trump. So that itself is um, a difficult, how, you, how do you appeal to those moderates and appeal to conservatives at the same time? Um, uh, the other thing is that you know, he's, a, he's a professional politician. I, again, I don't, I don't say that as a pejorative. I don't say that as a negative. He's devoted his life to public service. It's what he's done, 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 done for most of his career. And um, he may want to run for president. And he's got to have to f firm up his conservative base uh, and begin to plant seeds among some of these moderates who he will need if he's going to be a successful presidential candidate. So he had a tough time. You know, the other way, the snarky way of putting it would be that, you know, Pence cannot defend the undef indefensible. You can't defend, you know, you, you know, using the word rapist associating with an ethnic group. You can't say a federal judge. Is, is not qualified to hear a case because of his heritage. Uh, and these are things, by the way, that Pence criticized Trump on during the campaign. So he was in a really tough, awkward position. Um, I, I can't say I felt badly for him. You know, you, you pay your money, you take the chance. Um, if 
you don't like the heat, you know, what is it about the kitchen? If you don't, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. But um, uh, uh, it, clearly, a Pence was trying to help himself. But if he helped himself, he, he probably helped the campaign. And if the campaign goes down in flames, it's not going to help Trump, uh, 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 Pence either. So very complicated, convoluted answer, I know, but it's a complicated, convoluted situation. All right, thank you, Larry Levy, for joining, joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for watching. My name is Sarah Bornstein, and have a nice day.